Our topic tonight is who were the Philistines? So this will be hopefully a little bit of a fun one. So Philistine in English is a, uh, an ethnic slur, I guess. Um, this is kind of the perfect example of it, where I think is like Diane Chambers here from Cheers. She is elevated and cultured, and she is in this kind of working class bar, and all the people around her are, from her perspective anyway, Philistines, as she would call them, I think, more than once in the course of that series. And so in that context, when you're calling somebody a Philistine, you're meaning somebody who is antagonistic to, or they don't get art, especially, let's say, the fine arts, opera, ballet, so on. They don't get high culture and intellectual pursuits, or they don't value them, or in fact, they may in fact be actively antagonistic to them. And so that's the word, anyway, we, it's kind of a haughty word to disparage somebody. You're almost um, proving their point by calling them Philistines, <laughs> in other words, because you are, um, you know, using this sort of abstract word. But sort of weirdly, um, the word Philistine or calling somebody a Philistine has essentially no connection with the actual biblical portrait of the Philistines. And you might wonder, where does this even come from? So the biblical Philistines, even as described as the Bible, they're villains in the Bible, but it's not because they're opposed to fine culture or anything like that. That doesn't exist that way. And so actually, this modern usage, this calling people Philistines, that originates in modern times in the German college town of Jena in the 17th century. So there is traditionally in college towns a little bit of a, a disconnect and sometimes antagonism and rivalry between the university students and the people we call like the townies, which is to say the people who are not part of the university but live in the town. And so there had been a riot between the students and the townspeople, which actually got way out of hand and led to several deaths. And so during a funeral sermon, the preacher read from the Bible, the story of Samson and Delilah, and he quoted the line, the Philistines are upon you. And so then after that, the... Um, the students, when they were talking about the townies, their enemies, they would label them Philistines. So those guys are the Philistines, their enemies. And so as a result of that, this usage, um, this usage grew out of that, the idea that the, the people who aren't the university educated people, the people who don't understand intellectual pursuits and high culture, they're the Philistines. But again, like I say, this is a modern um, usage. It doesn't really reflect the biblical portrait at all. So, in fact, the Philistines are, if anything, seen in the Bible account as more powerful, perhaps more sophisticated, maybe more culturally decadent than their morally wholesome Israelite neighbors. So again, when we're going to be reading the biblical account, everything about the Philistines is being written by uh, from the perspective of people who consider Philistines to be the enemy, right? And so uh, one of the things that they want to be showing is that the, uh, the folks in Judah uh, are moral and wholesome and they have good old-fashioned values and they're not being uh, decadent and led away into all kinds of um, wild cultural things by their neighbors like the Philistines. So like I say, um, certainly in the portrayal and things like the Cecil B. DeMille uh, 1949 Cecil W. Mill film, Samson and Delilah, the Philistines definitely are not, um, they're not opponents of, of spectacle and culture and so on. They're having these shows and things like that. They, they actually are portrayed as culturally decadent, so the opposite of the modern um, use of the term. Um, so despite the fact that Philistines don't exist anymore as a distinct people and haven't for more than 2,000 years. They nevertheless, um, because of their portrayal in the Bible, there are some fairly famous Philistines. And so I mentioned this when we were doing our previews, that 
the name Goliath is a very well-known name. So Goliath is a Philistine from the story of David and Goliath. And I think actually Delilah is fairly well known because the story of Samson and Delilah is also uh, still pretty famous, even if not at the level of, of David and Goliath. So I want to look at both of these stories as we are going to unpack the biblical portrait of the Philistines so that then we can look at what the Bible gets right and what the Bible gets wrong, what we can tell from the rest of the historical, archaeological, and other record about who the Philistines actually were. So the Philistines, if you look at the map here of the Levant of Greater Canaan or Lesser Syria, this is the area um, uh, between, and well, essentially you can see the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the kind of to the uh, east, the kind of desert area, and to the west, the coastal plain and the Mediterranean Sea. And so um, the tribes of Israel are in the green areas in the tribal period. And so these are up in kind of the hill countries. And then the coastal plains are where coastal Canaanites and Phoenicians, who are really the same people, and then also the Philistines, you can see in the southwest in this kind of pink area. Um, this is the kind of the location of the kind of greater Canaanite-related peoples. So they're centered around five cities on that coastal plain. So those are cities like Ashkelon and Ashdod and Ekron and Gath and Gaza. They're among the Israelites' strongest antagonists during the period of the Judges. So before um, the biblical narrative has uh, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah emerge, the pow more powerful northern kingdom, the less powerful but uh, longer-lived southern kingdom centered on Jerusalem. Before uh, those emerged, the Bible talks of a period of time where all of these are simply tribes or tribal confederacies that then ultimately come together. And we call that period the period of the judges. So the Philistines then continue to be a separate power under the period of the kings. So they're interacting with King David in the biblical story, and they're still independent in the time of Hezekiah, which is to say one of the later kings of Judah at the time when the northern kingdom has already fallen to the Assyrians. The Philistines are still having wars and so forth with the kings of Judah. So the book of Judges yeah, the book of Judges, where um, yeah, let me say this, where it is from. When I talk about the Judges, it's from a set of books from Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, and First and Second Kings, that are all sort of part of the same school and are written together, which scholars call the Deuteronomic history. They're also using the same uh, basic themes and language as the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, one of the five books of the Pentateuch, one of the five books of the Torah, but one that is written by a different author than the rest. So within the Deuteronomic um, school, um, there is a very strong belief in a very particular answer to the problem of evil. So the problem of evil is we have here a um, omnipotent, great God, omniscient, and so forth, who is good, and yet for some reason there is unbelievable suffering in the world. Why uh, does God allow evil to exist when God could, uh, being all-powerful, immediately eliminate evil? So according to the Deuteronomist school, that evil exists and suffering exists as punishment. And so the children of Israel, God's people, suffer when they abandon the worship of their God, Yahweh, and they turn to foreign gods. In other words, when they do not keep God's commandment that thou shalt have no other gods before me, and that you will not make any graven idols, and so forth. So when um, the Israelites forget that, what usually happens is they, for example, marry foreign wives, they start 
worshiping other gods and so forth. Then the God of Israel makes use of neighboring peoples like the Philistines in order to conquer and oppress the Israelites, which then causes the Israelites to remember, oh yeah, we were supposed to obey God, and then this kind of thing wouldn't happen. And so I'll just start, I'll just say, mention here that this is an ancient answer to the problem of evil, which already um, in biblical times, in other words, while the Bible was still being composed centuries later, this answer is seen as quite inadequate. And it also, um, to us in modern times, is, uh, brings about a bunch of other problems. So, for example, um, it denies effectively the free will of the non-Israelite people. These, the Philistines and so forth, don't have any independent agency or merit. They are simply being used by God in order to uh, punish the only people that matter in this particular worldview, the Deuteronomist worldview, in other words, the people of Israel. And so even though this is definitely the intent of these authors of these biblical books, um, these are, I think, um, it's an intent or an explanation, an answer that is largely rejected by you know, modern uh, Christians and most modern Jews as well, I'm sure. So the cycle is best expressed actually in the book of Judges. And so, for example, again and again in the book of Judges, we hear Israel does evil in the eyes of God, Yahweh. In other words, they turn to idolatry, they worship other gods. The people are then given into the hands of their enemies by Yahweh. And once they are then in, uh, oppre being oppressed by the Midianites or the Amalekites or the Philistines, then Yahweh raises up a leader, a new judge over the people of Israel. The spirit of Yahweh comes upon the leader who then defeats the enemy and restores peace. And it'll say, like, there were 40, 40 years, essentially, where everything is great. And then the cycle begins again. And so, in this way, the book of Judges is really set in a mythic age of heroes in this time period before there were kings ruling over Judah and Israel. In other words, before the historic time period when the book of Judges was written. Um, and these are, it's sort of written in the form of a cycle, a collection of stories about each one of the individual judges and the enemy then that they are facing off from. So the first of these is a guy named Othniel. He's from the tribe of Judah and the enemy are the Aramites. Then there's Ehud, he's from the tribe of Benjamin who's fighting off the Moabites. Then Deborah, female judge, prophet, from the tribe of Ephraim, who fights off the Canaanites. Gideon from the tribe of Manasseh, who fights off the Midianites and the Amalekites and other Bedouins. Then Jephthah from the tribe of Gilead. Um, this is really from a time period before the um, 12 tribes his his we historically have were enumerated. And so 12 is kind of a magic number. There never were just 12 tribes. The idea that there, the 12 tribes represent 12 of the sons or grandsons of a guy named um, Israel or a guy named Jacob um, is a later myth. And indeed, um, when a lot of the books of Judges or the component texts of the book of Judges is written, they hadn't decided which of the different people would be tribes. And so Gilead is sometimes thought of as being a tribe. Uh, and he's fighting off against the Ammonites, and then finally Samson, who is from the tribe of Dan, who is fighting off the Philistines, and that's the one we'll look at. So, um, first of all, I do want to just show you the cycle by reading the story of Deborah, or a little component of the story, an excerpt, which is from chapter 4 and 5 of Judges. So we read, The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So again, that same, going back to that cycle, Ehud, um, they had done evil, Ehud right, righted the wrong, everybody was good for 40 years, and now we go back and they've done evil again. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, 
who lived in Harasheth HaGoyim. Then the Israelites call, cried out to the Lord for their help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he'd oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, the prophet, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came unto her for judgment. And so Deborah here, who is again the woman prophet, leader, judge, she calls a guy named Barak, who's from the tribe of Naphtali, one of the northern tribes, to lead troops from there and also from the neighboring tribe of Zebulun. She then goes with the army. He says he's not going to go unless she comes too. Um, and she says, sure, I'm going to go. And that'll just show, though, that the Lord is going to sell Sisera, this general of the Canaanites, into the hand of a woman. So um, one of the uh, themes of the book of Judges is to show that, in fact, it's not the actions of the Israelites or their army or anything like that, that God is, in fact, delivering them always. He's the one that's in charge. So the Israelite army gives battle. They subdue and slaughter the Canaanites. The enemy general, Sisera, the general of the Canaanite, he takes flight uh, and he goes and hides in a tent where he is killed by another woman, a woman named Jael, who kills him with a tent peg. So we read in a poem that's included in the book of Judges called the Song of Deborah um, about that. And so this is probably one of the places where we have an ancient source, a source that's older than the most of the texts of Judges, and some of, and the story that we have here of Deborah is taken from, out from the fact that this uh, poem had survived. And so in the poem we read, Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite of tent-dwelling women most blessed. Water, Sisera asked, milk she gave, she brought him curds in a lordly bowl. She put her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the worker's mallet. She struck Sisera a blow. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. <laughs> I always like that poem. <laughs> so anyway, it's very graphic. So, it just goes right back again, though. The Deuteronomist editor writes, the land had rest for 40 years to end the chapter, and then it begins the new cycle anew. The next chapter, the people again forget God. They again turn to idolatry. They're conquered by the Midianites and the Amalekites, and eventually they're delivered by a guy named Gideon. And Gideon then um, is famous. He uh, is able to deliver uh, Israel from the Midianites and the Amalekites, having limited his army again and again and again down to just a couple select men to show that uh, that it was really God doing it, not, not the strength of the Israelite army. Nevertheless, as the book goes on, the quality of the judges decline. And so Deborah had been a really great judge, but when we get to the very end, we get to the story of Samson, who is a really terrible <laughs> judge, actually. And so we'll read here a little bit from the story of Samson. So the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And so sometimes mention here that 40 is one of these magic numbers in the Bible. So 40 years effectively means a whole generation. So the Israelites wander in the wilderness for 40 years. That means so that everybody that left Egypt didn't make it through the, the wilderness with the handful of exceptions. Uh, and so 40 years is a magic number in the Bible. Um, one of the problems with all of the people who add up the biblical numbers and try to get back to say how old, what year the world was supposedly created, is it's going through very clearly, um, li entirely literary mythological works like, uh, like the book here of Judges, where it's just saying 40 years as a very arbitrary number. 40 years, then another cycle, 40 years, then another cycle. It has nothing to do with a chronology where this is like happening in 1820 and then 1860 and then 1900 or something like that. None of this is dated. These are all um, mythological stories that are being put together uh, in, a, 
in a systematic way, but in a way that is not really chronological. So anyway, the Philistines have uh, control for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. His wife was barren, having borne no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Although you're barren, having borne no children, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now be careful not to drink wine or strong drink or to eat anything unclean, for you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor is to come on his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from birth. So Samson's birth, then, is one of many providential fertility stories in the Hebrew Bible, and that goes alongside the story of Isaac, who was the uh, long-awaited son, miracle baby of Abraham and Sarah, born to Sarah long after um, Sarah has gone through menopause. And then the later story from the book of Samuel, uh, Samuel is another one of these, um, children born to a woman who's barren, and he ultimately becomes the very last of the judges, one of the great prophets, the prophet then who initiates the reign of the kings. So these stories from the Hebrew Bible, Samson's story, uh, Samuel's, Isaac's, and so forth, they serve as a model for the story Luke creates for the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah and Elizabeth, so that we have in the Christmas story in Luke's gospel. And it's also a template for the miraculous, or we should say immaculate conception of Mary, Jesus' mother, as told in the apocryphal infancy gospel of James, the Proto-Evangelion of James. We've had a lecture on that before. It's a story that, although it didn't make it into the Bible, um, provides all of these sort of um, semi-canonical lore for uh, Mary and Mary veneration in both, the, especially the Eastern Orthodox Church, but also in the Catholic Church. So, uh, Samson's birth here. So, often what happens when you have one of these uh, miracle babies, then the people, the parents feel like, well, they weren't going to get this baby anyway, and so they maybe need to specially dedicate the baby to God, or set the baby apart as an ascetic and so forth. And so Samuel's parents um, give Samuel to the priest Eli, and he's uh, raised in the, in the tabernacle next to the, uh, the in, in Shiloh. And same thing, Mary's parents, according to the Proto-Evangelion of James, um, give her to uh, the priests in the temple, and she's raised in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, likewise, in response to this miracle, Samson's parents dedicate their child to God. The angel told his mother that he's going to be a Nazarite. So in this case, they vow he will be raised as a special kind of ascetic. And so Nazarite means that he will abstain from wine and all great products. He will not cut his beard. He won't cut his hair. And he's going to avoid all kinds of ritual impurity. So, for example, um, coming into any kind of contact with a corpse, so you can't go to your mom's funeral because you would be exposing yourself to a dead body. That would make you impure. That's not allowed for Nazarites. You can't go walking around in a cemetery and so forth. Um, in this way, this is another example of how um, Luke has intertwined this. So John the Baptist is also... Um, one of these miracle babies, and he is an ascetic, uh, where he's off in the wilderness, living on, uh, wearing skins, and uh, living on honey and locusts and so forth. It's a different kind of ascetic. So I want to point out there is a very big distinction between a Nazarite and a Nazarene, and unfortunately because of how close these two words kind of sound, Nazarite and Nazarene, um, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of people who um, think that Jesus was a Nazarite or that a Nazarene means a Nazarite and so forth. Um, but in fact, they're not related at all. So a Nazarene is somebody like Jesus who is from the town of Nazareth, which is a little uh, almost previously unknown hamlet in Galilee um, uh, near Sephoris. 
And so a Nazarite, though, is a person who has become consecrated, the Hebrew word there is nazir, by taking an ascetic vow. And so in the book of Numbers, in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, there is essentially the vow that you need to take in order to set yourself apart and consecrate yourself uh, to living this special kind of ascetic uh, consecrated lifestyle. And so one of those things is don't cut your hair. And so that is something that is one of the, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of how many of these that the Sikhs have, six or seven things that they do that set them apart. You know, so carrying a ceremonial dagger and so forth. One of them is uh, not cutting your hair. And so that's one of the, and then they wear worn normally here. Jagmeet Singh is one of the uh, major party leaders here in Canada. He normally doesn't let his hair down like this, uh, but you can see it's really long underneath his turban, uh, which he normally would wear. And so this is the same kind of religious observation that Samson would have. And I'd like to think the same kind of hair. <laughs> okay. So although Samson's birth is miraculous and he's favored by the Lord with superhuman physical strength, especially when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, then he's able to do all kinds of uh, amazing feats. He does seem to be lacking in the brains department, and from my perspective, he's not a very sympathetic figure because he sort of acts like a jerk. So we read uh, when he becomes an adult. This is pretty much the very first story we have from the book of Judges about Samson. Once Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw a Philistine woman. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw a Philistine woman at Timnah, now get her for me as a wife. <laughs> but his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among your own kin, among all our people, that you must go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, because she pleases me. So they go ahead and do that. And so while they uh, are in the process, is walking around, Samson encounters a lion, which he uh, tears apart barehanded. And the Bible says, quote, as, as one might tear apart a kid. And so I don't know, I guess some people have goats that they tear apart <laughs> with their hands. But in any event, Samson um, does that with a lion. And later, when he comes back and sees the carcass of the lion, he sees that a swarm of bees have made a hive there, and now there is honey that is being formed in the carcass of the lion. So that's used later. So during his wedding feast that he's having with the Philistine woman, Samson and all the Philistine guys start playing a game of riddles and, and, and betting with each other who's going to win the riddle, riddle uh, contest. And so um, Samson uh, offers as his riddle, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And he bets that none of those Philistine guys can guess what he's talking about. Um, of course, the Philistines have no idea what Samson could mean anymore, I think, than Gollum knows what Bilbo is in The Lord of the Rings is asking about when he says, or in The Hobbit, when he says, uh, what is in my pocket? <laughs> you know, how would you know what's in his pocket? How, do you, how would anybody know about Samson and this lion with honey in it? Nevertheless, they've made the bet and they now want to win. They don't want to have to pay up all of these, um, uh, the, the 30 fine garments that they will have to owe Samson if they, if they lose. And so uh, Samson, they encourage Samson's wife to get the secret out of him. Samson tells her the secret. She tells it to the Philistines who thus win the bet, making Samson super angry. So then he responds by going to a different Philistine town he slaughters 30 other Philistines and he takes their robes and he gives them back to the guys uh, to win, to, you know, to pay off the bet. So um, doesn't win his bet, doesn't, doesn't really, he doesn't really come out a loser financially, but he obviously now has not made himself particularly popular. So after another argument, uh, Samson decides that he's going to get back at the Philistines, but he doesn't want to get his hands dirty by him being the one running around killing everybody. So he catches 300 foxes. He ties a lit torch to their tails. He ties two foxes each together to a torch. And he lets those 300 foxes loose in the Philistines' fields and vineyards and burns them all down. Um, 
again, he's not an animal lover here, and I don't think this is a very good idea of plausible deniability. I mean, I don't that he doesn't going to get in trouble for that, but in any event, the Philistines aren't sure what they can do with him. Uh, at another occasion, there's a Philistine war party. They tie Samson up, uh, but he is able to instantly break out of his bonds, and even though he's unarmed, he grabs a, from a corpse of a donkey, he grabs a jawbone, and he just uses that bone to beat and kill a thousand armed Philistine soldiers. So in other words, the guy has superhuman strength and he can't be stopped uh, by any regular means. And so then we get to the story of Samson and Deliah. After this, we read, Samson fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The lords of the Philistines came to her and said, coax him and find out what makes his strength so great and how we may overpower him so that we may bind him in order to subdue him and we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me what makes your strength so great and how you can be bound so that one could subdue you. <laughs> so really subtle, Delilah. But fortunately, Samson's really dumb. But anyway, he doesn't want to tell right away, so he lies. He says, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that are not dried out, then I shall become weak and be like anyone else. So the lords of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not dried out, and she bound him with them. And while men were lying in wait in an inner chamber, she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as a strand of fiber snaps when it touches the fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. And rather than Samson getting mad at Delilah for clearly trying to betray him, <laughs> Delilah is able to say, you mocked me, you told me lies. Please tell me how you could be bound. So far from seeing through Delilah's plot, Samson tells her another false weakness. <laughs> It's the same, goes through the same rigmarole, same results, and she's now really upset with him for continuing lying to her. And so he finally breaks down and tells her his true weakness, which is if he breaks his Nazarite vow. So in other words, if you cut his amazing hair, then he will be weak as any other person. So then uh, while he's asleep, Delilah cuts all his hair off. And then this final time, the Philistines are able to seize him. And once they have a hold of him, they gouge his eyes out and they um, put him in bonds and they send him to work in the mills, uh, turning millstones as a slave for the rest of his life. So that's uh, Samson. <laughs> After a miserable life in slavery, Samson is being displayed at a festival at the temple of Dagon. And after praying for strength from the Lord one last time, he pushes the pillars off their foundation, causing the whole place to collapse, killing thousands of Philistines, the book of Judges says, in this one big calamity that he causes at the end of his life, he was able to kill more Philistines than he had been able to the whole rest of his life. So ultimately, again, um, a guy who was a judge of Israel, who was favored of the Lord, who was obviously uh, definitely an uh, enemy to the enemies of the Israelite people, but was really more or less just killing them randomly on his own rather than for any particular, like leading the people to freedom or anything like that. So again, the book of Judges uh, breaks down by the end as the judges get to less and less quality. So while the story of Samson and Deliah is a pretty great story, I think uh, Goliath is much more of a household name since David and Goliath has become a shorthand for that kind of archetype story where an underdog defeats a giant foe, or at least takes on a giant foe. So the biblical account from the book of Samuel, the first book of Samuel, Goliath is the Philistines champion, the champion of the Philistines army, and he is a literal giant, while David, who is the little guy that is taking on the Goliath and the David and Goliath story, is a shepherd boy who's armed only with a sling. So we read in that book, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Soko. King Saul and the Israelites gathered. So this is after, this is the end of the period of Judges. The very first king has been appointed by the last judge, Samuel, and that is a guy named Saul. They gathered and camped in the valley of Elah 
and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was four cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had great greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. So none of Saul's men is willing to fight this giant champion of the Philistines uh, until David, a young shepherd boy, volunteers. Um, Saul, who's kind of mortified that none of his great fighting men have been willing to uh, face Goliath in a field, decides to give David his armor. The boy doesn't fit the armor and he's untrained in any of that kind of warfare. So instead he chooses five smooth stones for his sling and he kills Goliath with a sling shot to the forehead and then takes Goliath's own sword to, or I think maybe Saul's sword anyway, to behead anyway the giant. And so a number of scholars in reading this story have pointed out that all of that description of Goliath's armor with the greaves and all of the bronze and everything like that resembles that of Greek warriors of the sixth century. And also this idea of combat by champions as a heroic idea that seems like it's more at home in Greek epics like the Iliad than in the rest of ancient Near Eastern mythology. And indeed, there's even a very similar story in the Iliad itself uh, where a young hero, Nestor, actually fights uh, with a giant and defeats the giant. Um, interestingly, Goliath is actually slain a second time in a different passage in the Bible. So the Bible also includes a second story which reads, Then there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob. And Elhanan, son of Jerry Oregim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So it's the same Goliath, right? So he's, uh, there was war, again war at Gath, where there was a man of great size who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. He too was descended from the giants. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of David's brother, Shimei killed him. These four were descendants from the giants in Gath. They fell by the hands of David and his servants. So um, why are there two stories where Goliath gets killed, one by David and one by an otherwise unknown hero, Elhanan the Bethlehemite? So, one of the things that happens in mythology is that um, more famous heroes uh, absorb the stories of less famous heroes. More famous, bigger gods absorb the stories of less famous gods. The story is really cool. People want the hero you know about to have done it, and so that's probably what's happened here. So, although David, the ancestor of the kings of Judah, is often cited as the earliest historical figure in the Bible. So we have um, you know, extra biblical uh, um, inscriptions that talk about David, but the way they talk about him is that the kings of Judah, the kings of Jerusalem, are understood to be from a house of David. And so in other words, he is an eponymous ancestor for later guys and is therefore assumed to have been a historic person. But about that historical person, other than the fact that he's the ancestor of the kings of Judah, 
nothing historical as known, and indeed it's very unlikely that any of the biblical stories attached to David is historical. Rather, these are mythic stories that are written much later. Uh, in some cases, we can see like David and Goliath are probably coming uh, from a different myth. So a, guy, a myth in which a different unknown hero, Elhanan the Bethlehemite, kills a giant. And then over time, Elhanan's deeds are absorbed by the most famous hero, David. So just want to look now at the biblical picture that we've gone through of the Philistines as we're evaluating our question, who are the Philistines? So the Bible locates the Philistines in the southwest. We've seen it's around a kind of a pentapolis of city-states with some uh, additional smaller places that they own or dominate. They're among the most powerful antagonists of the Israelites at the time of the judges and at the time of David. And they generally continue to maintain their autonomy till the end of the period of the kings of Judah. So there's some time periods when the Bible claims that the Philistines are under the hegemony of the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah. But in general, they are always maybe just paying tribute and they can always rebel and, and fight and take back over and so forth. We also hear that they intermarry with Israelites. So Samson himself is married to Philistines and having affairs with other Philistines. And in the course of that, um, there's no trouble communicating. So, um, uh, Samson isn't having to speak through interpreters or anything like that. So the biblical writers are understanding the Philistines as more or less speaking the same uh, Canaanite Hebrew language. Um, if we look at the names that we have in the Bible, things like Ahimelech, Tinti, Hanan, those are Semitic, although some of the other names like Goliath are not Semitic and possibly might have an Indo-European background and many of these have been suggested by different scholars. Um, their armor and cultural style, style in like the David and Goliath story that we see are kind of vaguely Greek or maybe even more than vaguely. Nevertheless, we also see that they are worshiping, they're not worshiping Zeus and, and Apollo and so on, they're worshiping Canaanite gods like Dagon in the Samson story anyway. So, um, those are generally what we have in terms of the, of the biblical narrative. So what we also kind of see is um, that at a certain point after uh, the destruction of the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, that the Philistines fall out of the biblical narrative. So like other small powers in Canaan, the Philistines were conquered by the great Mesopotamian empires that emerged. First, the empire of the Assyrians, that's shown here. Uh, and then later, the Neo-Babylonians, who also destroy the kingdom of Judah and destroy the uh, city of Jerusalem. So over time, the, the majority of the Philistine people will have continued to live there, just as the majority of the people of Judah and Israel all continue to live there. Uh, although in some cases the elites are taken away into exile by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and so forth, and new people are moved to the area as well, colonized the area by these Mes Mesopotamian empires. And so over time, the descendants of the Philistines lost their distinct character and became just a regular Aramaic or Syrian, essentially speaking people, um, just like the people of Israel and Judah also became Aramaic speaking, although they continued to maintain their separate religions. And nevertheless, they just became the same. The Philistines just essentially became part of the same Aramaic speaking uh, people, which we sometimes call Syrio-Phoenician, the people of this area, in other words. However, at the very same time, their name, Philistine, also started to become a applied to this entire area, which had been called Canaan or Lesser Syria, which is to say, instead of Philistia, it now becomes Palestina, Palestine. And so that already exists as a place name centuries before um, that becomes the Roman provincial name for the area. Uh, it's one of the place names for this part of the Levant, uh, also sometimes Israel, Judah, Lesser Syria, Canaan, so forth. There's a lot of Syria, Phoenicia, a lot of different names for this area, Palestine. 
So when we're evaluating the biblical portrait, we always have to remember that the historical context presented is the context of the author, not the subjects. So ancient texts reflect the historical context that the authors themselves are writing in their own time period. They are not um, able to talk about the actual history that occurred hundreds and thousands of years before them because they lack uh, uh, the, the discipline of history to ex doesn't exist for them to be able to write history. So they are telling stories. They want it to be about the past, but in fact, the they inevitably are portraying their own present or how things are operating in their present. And that's true for all these ancient documents. So the Iliad, the great Greek epic, is set in the time of the late Bronze Age collapse. So the Trojan War is taking place, apparently anyway, in the backdrop of the Bronze Age collapse, the early 12th century BC. But it's only composed orally 400 years later, and thus, it, while it remembers some things from the 12th century, just a handful of things, it mostly reflects actually the historical context of its author, which is called by convention Homer. Uh, so in other words, something it reflects more the context of the 8th century. So likewise, the Deuteronomic texts, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, they're written around the time of the exile. There might have been a first draft that is written before the destruction of Jerusalem and a second draft and later edits uh, after, during the exile and after the exile. And the Deuteronomic texts reflect that context rather than the time period that they're set. So the, Bible, but the Bible's picture of the Philistines then represents the Philistines as the people of Judah saw them just before the fall of Jerusalem in 587. So from that context, they are now a mil militarily strong local neighbor that speaks the same language as you. You don't have to use interpreters. They have a lot of the same customs and religion as the rest of the Canaanites. So they're worshiping Canaanite gods like Dagon. And there's perhaps some memory of Greek cultural ties. So either Philistines great ancestors or just as likely the Philistines now because they're a coastal people are in contact still with uh, present day sixth century um, Greeks who are able to sell themselves in numbers as mercenaries and so they are being used as mercenaries in different places, possibly Egypt as well. So there could also be, that could also be the, um, the basis for the description of Goliath as sort of a Greek hero. Uh, if there are Greek mercenaries operating among the Philistines in the time period of the first temple period. So what does the Bible get wrong and what does it get right? So, the Bible provides our only significant literary narratives about the Philistines, but we do have a few references in the extra-biblical historical record, and they're really important ones, and those are also supplemented by a lot of archaeology now and also by DNA studies. And so that allows us to um, look at, again, reading the Bible for its own biases, for its relatively good portrait when it's closest to the time period when it's actually being written and how it deviates very broadly from actual history the further back you go in time. And that helps us to answer this question, who were the Philistines? So the backdrop um, of this, just like with the Trojan War, is this really important event uh, at the end of the Bronze Age, at the beginning of the Iron Age, the late Bronze Age collapse that takes place between 1200 and 1500. This is a time period of a large number of migrations that are happening both uh, by land and by sea. So this is a time period when Dorians are overrunning essentially the Greek mainland. Uh, sea peoples are also maybe attacking. And so the preceding Mycenaean civilization, kind of this proto-Greek, civilization uh, that is remembered just vaguely 
as the heroic age, the age uh, of the Iliad, of the Tro Trojan War, and before, uh, by the later Greeks, this whole civilization collapses, and indeed both them and the Minoans, who have another uh, kind of proto-Greek civilization on Crete, uh, both lose their capacity, even their written language. And so there is a pretty big civilization collapse, and next following there, a Greek Dark Ages. Meanwhile, also in Anatolia, what we now think of as Turkey, the great ancient empire of the Hittites also collapses. That's the end of that civilization. And there's more chaos happening as Bedouins and others uh, infiltrate the Middle East and Mesopotamia. Egypt, um, like the rest of the great civilizations, is attacked by these migrants, by the Sea Peoples, but the Egyptians um, fend them off and defeat them, repel them, and also other migrants from like Libya and other places. Uh, but Egypt doesn't get away unscathed, and indeed Egypt, having defeated the Sea Peoples and preventing them from settling or conquering and settling in Egypt proper, nevertheless does uh, apparently allow, although they're not don't even really admit it, allow th those same sea peoples to settle within the Egyptian empire. So the Egyptians had owned this territory that later becomes Philistia, so the coastal plain of southwest Canaan. And now these sea peoples um, uh, that failed to conquer Egypt are settled in that area. So according to a series of contemporary Egyptian relief sculptures and texts, the Egyptians defeat the Sea Peoples. Egypt always wins in any war on its own, <laughs> in its own history. Even if it doesn't win, they come back and write that they won and so forth. And it's only when, it's only when the people actually are, you know, the dynasty is actually toppled that you know that they didn't really win. Uh, but in this particular case, there does seem to have been like a, a, a kind of victory because the government remains in place, but nevertheless, some of the Sea Peoples, like I say, get settled uh, within the a nearby area of the Egyptian Empire. And these include, there's a whole bunch of different named peoples in the Egyptian texts, and one of these are the Peleset, um, which almost all scholars, because of the Peleset getting settled into later Philistia, all scholars pretty much are, can have a consensus that these then are the Philistines, a sea people. And so, like I say, the, migra the Egyptians repel them, they do let them live in neighboring Canaan, or they go move there without the, with or without the Egyptian uh, say so. Um, archaeology also backs up that Egyptian count, account. So um, early early Iron Age, late Bronze Age archaeology in these Philistine sites um, show all kinds of things that differ from the 12th century onward from the rest of Canaan. So for example, the Philistines are busy eating pork, whereas all the rest of uh, Semitic peoples are not doing that. Their pottery has more parallels with the pottery that's going on in the Greek world, the Mycenaean world, and rather than being using the Phoenician Hebrew styles of scripts, Canaanite scripts, they're using an Aegean script, one of the Minoan style scripts, which are using it to write initially some non-Semitic language. Nevertheless, um, there's all kinds of other survivals of Semitic elements, including, for example, a lot of the toponyms, a lot of the place names in the Philistine areas continue to have their original or you know, predate predating their conquest uh, names. And so, you know, sometimes rarely in an ancient or medieval conquest, um, a conqueror will actually kill everybody and displace people. But it's way more likely, especially when you're arriving uh, by boat, that you will just kind of bring a warrior elite. That elite will kill off whoever the um, soldiers were of the local people at the time that you defeat. And then you keep all of the peasants who more or less stay the same and slowly who sort of intermarry with them. And so like, for example, as we know in the, the Norman conquest of England, uh, over time, the smaller Norman population, which spoke 
uh, Norman French, they ultimately assimilated into the local Anglo-Saxon population and together uh, created the language of Middle English, which has lots and lots of French loanwords, but is still primarily growing out of Anglo-Saxon. And so in the same kind of way here, it's a smaller conquering um, pa uh, power, the Sea Peoples, these Peliset Philistines, who then give their name to the whole people who are um, become you know, wedded together as a sort of a Canaanite and Canaanite-speaking Philistine people once, once they assimilate. There's all kinds of examples like this. So the, for example, the Serbs and the Croats, they're both names, the names of those are, are taken from um, Turkic peoples who, who came and, con uh, and conquered local Slavic tribes, but the language that they speak is Slavic because the tiny elite back in the uh, early Middle Ages that conquered uh, both of those got, gets completely assimilated and uh, loses any, any kind of distinction that the conquering people had. Um, this same archaeological background and the Egyptian um, evidence has been confirmed more recently by DNA study of skeletons from Iron Age Ashkelon, so one of the Philistine uh, uh, Pentapolis cities, so one of the main five cities, and it shows that the population's ancestry was largely Semitic, but it included a large, a, a significant anyway, European admixture. So this would be consistent with the idea that um, Mycenaeans or Minoans or uh, people from that are migrating, sea people that are migrating uh, from the Greek zone conquer the area of Philistia, and then they're intermarry with and ultimately are assimilated by the native population. And so um, that will just kind of give us, you know, if we look at kind of the timeline of this, this is going to kind of show us both a timeline of ancient Greece, but also the Middle East and uh, the Levant. And so we're starting here at 1200, this period of the Bronze Age collapse, the fall of Mycenae, the time period when the Trojan War is, is set. Egyptians are fighting the Sea Peoples, the Hittite Empire is falling. The Sea Peoples don't conquer Egypt, but instead the Philistines uh, come to Canaan, and now we have this period of time where there is essentially an autonomous Philistine pentapolis, so the city-states of Philistia. You can see when early on in that, the stories of Samson and Goliath, Samson and Delilah, David and Goliath are set. So they're set at the same time period as the end of the, the judges, the beginning of the mythical united monarchy of Israel. So the monarchy under Saul, David, and Solomon, all mythical figures. There's not actually a united monarchy, but in any event, right at the beginning of that. That, though, is written down, if you see kind of between 600 and then 550, I'm writing here DTR1, DTR2. So those are potentially drafts of the Deuteronomic history. So somewhere in there, those stories are being written down and they reflect therefore more that time period or you know, like a little bit of memory of how it would have been from ancient times, but they don't really know how things were. Um, you can see then the time period of the Kingdom of Israel, the Great Northern Kingdom, and then later the Kingdom of Judah, which survives uh, after the Assyrians destroy the Northern Kingdom, but then is destroyed by the Babylonians, leading to that period of the Babylonian captivity and so forth. And then you can see the composition of the Iliad up in the Greek zone, and how that's also similarly written um, much later than the time period of the Trojan War. So it's actually kind of kind of comparable to Greek mythology here and the Israelite mythology. So the Bible's picture of the Philistines then, like with everything with the Bible, is more accurate as we get to the end of the biblical period. So by the time we get to the later kings, like King Hezekiah, who is waging a war against the Philistines, that's when we're actually getting a little bit more of a picture of the historical Philistines. But then when you further, the further you go back, the further you get away from the authors and when they're actually writing, 
then you're getting to a place where it's becoming less and less historical and more and more mythic as the authors are setting stories centuries or more in the past, a past that they have no actual access to. And so then when you go way far back, for example, when you get to the book of Genesis and you have Abraham and Isaac, both of them go and visit a Philistine king, Abimelech, centuries uh, before the Philistines will have arrived in the Levant. In other words, Abraham and Isaac supposedly live long before the Bronze Age collapse. Um, but again, this is a time period about which the authors of the Bible have no uh, historical record or, or memory or anything like that. And so uh, it's no wonder that they introduce an anachronism, like Abraham and Isaac are running around with the Philistines because they have no idea that the Philistines weren't there yet. And indeed, the whole stories of Abraham and Isaac are all entirely mythical with no, no historical basis. So who were the Philistines? Like I say, the Philistines then most likely began as a proto-Greek people who migrate by sea from the Aegean during the Bronze Age collapse, failing to conquer Egypt. They instead conquer a part of Canaan that had sort of been part of the Egyptian empire. This became Philistia. And for a while, they maintained their language and customs while intermarrying with and slowly assimilating to the local Canaanite culture and religion. And in, in so doing then, in the course of this, the Goliath story, where we have an almost Homeric um, story of a Homeric hero, giant, um, and, and his conqueror, the uh, young upstart who's created this whole antitype or this whole archetype of the, the David and Goliath story, um, may in fact be just one tiny bit of actual memory of the Philistines' mythic past. And so that was my uh, look at who were the Philistines. I'm going to get a water while Leandro is maybe going to tell me if you guys have had any questions. <laughs> Otherwise, if you don't, haven't had any yet, go ahead and ask some questions. I can give you a second. Ask also ask questions on topics first. Yeah, ask on topic questions <laughs> about the Philistines if you have any, or if you found that's interesting or additional questions or so forth. Okay. Well, first, I want to thank uh, a bunch of you for supporting the channel. So, I want to thank Brad Stewart. Tolkien Study, Daryl Scott, Adan Altamirano, and Filippo De Noto. Thank you guys. I really, really appreciate um, uh, that you're helping support these lectures. It really allows us to do this. Uh, Tolkien Study says, Bob Dylan, in his record, Foot of Pride says, a Philistine is what she was. She'll do wondrous works for, with your fate feed you coconut bread and spice buns in bed if you don't mind sleeping with head in. <laughs> well, okay, I don't know that song and I'm trying to think, you know, so I was trying to look in, in, into it where a Philistine is what she is. So, so there's two different potential references whenever a modern artist is going to be saying a Philistine is what you are. So if it could be just calling somebody a Philistine, which is like I say, the, a person who's uncouth and doesn't like culture, they don't like opera and, and uh, the ballet and so forth. Uh, when you have somebody who is a, um, you know, a highly literate uh, person, like Bob Dylan, he may be, you know, he's saying she'll do wondrous works with your fate, feed you coconut bread. I, mean, yeah, I, I don't know. And so that could just simply be um, a reference to Delilah. So he could be retelling the Delilah story. I'd have to know what more of the song goes. But essentially, um, uh, a Delilah person in this particular case would be, the implication is that she doesn't have your best interests at heart and she's, gonna, she's going to betray you, right? All right. Are there other questions? Because that wasn't really a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, Fastball Flake says, having Samson as the last judge is a suggestion that he was the worst. Well, I, I'm saying that 
that's my reading of the text and lots of other scholars who um, have written commentaries on the judges are saying that. So in other words, um, the, the author of judges in putting different stories or fables together to create the whole story seems to have classed them so they put the good judges first and they decline. Certainly Samson, I would say, is the worst, not just because he's the last, but because of how he acts. So he, um, he isn't really doing anything like other, uh, the other judges like, like Deborah that we read about or Gideon, they actually get an army together and they go and, uh, and relieve uh, Israel from whoever has conquered them. And so, so Samson, you know, here he has got all of the superhuman strength. If he were to call all of the Israelites together to follow him into battle, knowing that he can all by himself with a, a donkey jaw, he can kill a thousand Philistines, you know, kind of by himself. They're all going to go to battle and, and it's not going to take very long for him to, to defeat the Philistines and they won't be in bondage anymore. Right. But instead of doing that, he's just wandering around and, uh, wanting to marry Philistine women and, and have affairs with other Philistine women and then getting mad and just randomly killing a bunch of Philistines all by himself, but without any kind of um, a coherent plan. He's just a chaos agent that is sort of mostly self-serving. So even though he's been given all of this favor from God, he doesn't actually, actually use it well. And so that's why I think he is probably, um, you know, in terms of the marks, I think it's hard to argue that, that he wouldn't be the worst. Um, and I'm just saying, suggesting that part of the literary conceit of the book of Judges is that it isn't working to have the Israelite tribes be independent from one another and not have any central coherent authority. They later realize when, when, when the last judge, the first judge out of the book of Judges, now Samuel, who is, uh, again, a good judge, uh, when he, um, who is also a prophet, when he... Uh, ultimately uh, agrees to appoint a king, and he appoints Saul initially and then later David as the king over Israel, um, he, he points out that you're gonna, you will have problems if you, ha if you allow a monarch to exist. So a monarch is going to do two things. He's going to take all of your sons so that your sons have to fight his wars for him. So he's going to create an army and he's going to take all your daughters and they're going to be concubines and so forth. So, so you, are, you are going to have to face tyranny with, um, with a centralized monarchy is essentially the point of that. But nevertheless, if you don't have it, you're going to lose all these battles because all of the people with the centralized monarchies are always, are always going to defeat you. So Andrew uh, Suriali, thank you for your support. And then you ask also, can you talk about how um, the archaeological studies of the Philistines uh, sh show that they didn't really worship Dagon, but instead that they have a goddess figure. So yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things that happens with um, archaeology and uh, of biblical peoples is people a lot of times put the Bible in their hand and they go to look in the, in the ground for things to find in the same way that um, Schliemann or whatever had Homer in his hand and is looking around to find, to dig up stuff uh, you know, in Greece and Turkey uh, about the, from the Iliad and the Odyssey and so forth. And you want to find the thing that the book says. And so the book talks about, um, uh, the Bible talks about Dagon. You know, in other words, according to the Bible, uh, uh, Dagon is the national god of the Philistines. Um, but that does seem to be maybe a confusion. So, the, so the, the, that might just be a biblical conceit. Um, the, there is no, like you say, the archaeological evidence doesn't show that. So we don't see anything to indicate that there's big Dagon temples or, or that Dagon is the national god of the Philistines. Instead, as you say, uh, there's a, a, a goddess figure. So, um, it's, and so probably, it's probably not. It just shows again how um, the Bible, you know, doesn't preserve, you know, everything and sometimes it's getting things wrong. And so, so there is a convention in the Bible um, that the biblical henotheists want, where, the, uh, where they want to have essentially Yahweh be the God of Israel, and then they want to have national gods for the other uh, peoples around. So they want to have uh, Chemosh be the God of Moab, and they want to have Dagon be the God of the Philistines. And whereas that does seem to be the case 
uh, for Moab because we have extra biblical uh, uh, source in terms of the Moab uh, stele that it does suggest that the Moabites did consider Hamash to be their god in the same way that um, Israel considered Yahweh to be their god. Um, the archaeology does not back that up for the Philistines, and so um, and so this is a, probably a, a situation where the writers of the Bible have a conceit and they want to plaster that onto everybody else, but it doesn't actually wasn't actually true for the Philistines. Uh, J.H., uh, thank you for your support. I uh, appreciate that. You say, the comment is, every religious leader should have your training. Big fan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, that support. Um, Daryl Scott says, are things like the Samson and Delilah story actually intended to be funny, or are they just funny to modern readers? I think they're intended to be funny. Um, and so I think that one of the... Um, so, so definitely, this is a literary story. You know, so you can tell whenever something happens um, in threes. You know, there's a rule of threes, and the rule of threes is a literary conceit. And so, um, you know, Do Samson De tells Delilah the wrong thing. She, uh, she, she does the, goes through the whole thing. She ambushes him. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Then they do it again, <laughs> and, and the same exact thing happens. And then they finally do it again, and on the third time they catch him. So that's a that's a, a literary story. It's, um, it's either, there's, there's kind of two different ways that these kind of are, are formed. There's like folk stories, but then there's also courtly stories. And so a lot of the Deuteronomic stories, um, because again, for them to have been written, uh, ultimately have to be kind of among the elites. And so lots, as we see in the Torah too, lots of the stories are not particularly what we think of as as religious stories, but that just means they're not priestly stories. There's priestly texts we have too, and the priestly texts are intensely boring <laughs> as they're worked into the Bible. Uh, but the great stories, the fun stories, are more probably courtly stories. So these are stories that, um, that people in the courts of the king of Judah or uh, the, the elites in exile in Babylon or wherever they would be, these are stories that they tell each other for entertainment. And so, as you say, they, they're telling, they have a purpose too, but they're also meant to be entertaining. So they're funny and funny to modern readers, I think both. Um, Donnie Lynn Gringo asks, who was there in that area first, the tribes of Judah or the Philistines? So the, Can the Canaanite people in general were all there first. And so there would have been um, essentially uh, a people we kind of are calling Canaanites, but we could also call, call um, Aramites, Proto-Syrians, you know, which are all uh, the Semitic people that are from all of the area between Egypt and Mesopotamia. And they're a spectrum of related people. So the Phoenicians are the same people. They're just the same people that are living now on the coast of the area we call Phoenicia, uh, the Syrians, and so forth. So they're all the same. The Israelites are there too, and they are the same, but they haven't come together and called themselves Israelites. They are individual little Canaanite peoples, Danites and Judahites and Ephraimites and Manassehites and so forth. Um, and the same thing with the um, people that are where the Philistines live before the Philistines come and conquer them. So what happens next is the Philistines, um, the sea people conquering uh, elite of the Philistines come in and conquer that bare bit of Canaanite Canaan that it becomes known as Philistia. And so it then becomes a union of the two peoples, the, um, the existing Canaanite people who ultimately assimilate their Philistine conquerors and then the Philistines in general. So those guys, if you think of the Philistines as the sea people of conquerors, they get there later. But the Israelites, despite the myth that they have, that they are from uh, exiles from Egypt who leave in a great exodus. That is a non-historical myth. Instead, what happens is the Israelite people are regular Canaanites who emerge out of, um, out of the rest of the Canaanites, and, they, and, they, and they're coming together as a uh, kind of an ethno-religious uh, grouping of, of multi-tribes of people more or less under the, uh, the state monarchy, specifically initially the state monarchy of the Kingdom of Israel based in, the, in Samaria, 
and then later, after the fall of that kingdom to the Assyrians, uh, to that same, its successor state, the kings of uh, Judah at Jerusalem. And so those, um, those people then consider themselves to all be Israelites, but they are all um, emerging out of that same uh, broader Canaanite Syrian background. Um, Johnson asks, is there a possible uh, connection between the Philistines and the Hyksos? So I think they aren't. And so the Hyksos, um, I just have to get the timeline on those guys. I think that's earlier. And I think that they're um, pretty confident anyway, and that, and that they're not related to the Philistines who are a sea people. But the Hyksos are, um, are because they are a um, foreign probably Semitic people that have conquered uh, the Egyptian Delta, they are intertwined with um, ideas that people would like to have to try to make the Exodus story historical, um, which in the previous question I was just rejecting. <laughs> so, so I don't think that, 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 that they are related to that and they're also not related to the Philistines. Uh, Adan Altamirano says, um, I'm Jewish and I'm interested in the topic. Can John comment uh, on the theory of the original split kingdoms that there was no united monarchy? Yeah, um, so, so we've had a couple lectures on that before. Um, and so once again, the, um, when the archeology span was first being done, like, like I say, uh, in the same way that uh, uh, the archeology span of Greece and Turkey was being done looking at the Iliad and Odyssey and trying to dig up stuff and eventually finding Troy, finding Mycenae, Mycenae but finding them very different uh, from what uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey said. Likewise, uh, archeology span in Israel, Palestine has been focused on, you know, trying to dig up stuff and find the Bible. And obviously um, uh, the central um, conceit of the Bible is that the original, there's an original kingdom of Israel centered on Jerusalem of which David and then Solomon are kings. And then after Solomon, there is a division uh, and suddenly all of Israel splits off from the capital, essentially almost everything, the wealthy part, 10 tribes, everything is, is now in, taking the name too. And all that's left with the Southern kingdom is uh, two small tribes, the capital, and so forth. Uh, and, so, um, and so that's the, um, pr how it's presented in the Bible. Uh, the, the archaeology does not bear that out. And so, and so Jerusalem um, never, at the, in this preceding time period, so until the destruction of the northern kingdom, that's when the rise of Jerusalem happens. That's when uh, Judah takes off, and that's when all of this uh, literary... Uh, um, stuff begins that ultimately creates the Bible. Uh, if you go back to that time period when David and Solomon were supposed to be around, Jerusalem is a little hill town with nothing in it. It just cannot be the center of a giant Iron Age kingdom. Not giant, but anyway, as big as that. You have to look to Samaria, to the northern kingdom. That's where um, the, the, uh, the, t the center of that is at that time period. And so, and so ultimately what happened is um, when the northern kingdom is destroyed and the exiles come and they come bring and bring things south to Jerusalem, the courtiers and other people from the northern kingdom bring their richer traditions, their higher culture, and they create the conceit to the local monarch, the Davidic king, and they say, no, don't you remember, we remember in our stories that once you ruled over both kingdoms, your ancestors ruled over both kingdoms, and now we're reuniting them together again under a Davidic monarch. And so that is a, a myth, uh, and, the, um, and the motivation for it will have been that uh, the northern kings are gone, and the southern kings are the patrons that are more or less paying for these books to be written. Uh, Julie uh, uh, Brzezuski says, I read that the Philistines were Indo-Europeans and perhaps part of the Sea Peoples. Yes, so that's what we were saying. And so when I was suggesting that um, uh, that they're maybe the Mycenaeans and so forth, Proto-Greeks, that they are coming from the Aegean, or maybe 
Another possibility is Anatolia, so Luvian peoples. So Indo-European peoples that are migrating uh, to uh, Philistia by way of Egypt. So they attack Egypt and do not conquer it and instead move to Philistia, so yes. Uh, Mike Rogers asks, how many female judges and prophets are there besides Deborah? Well, there's lots of female prophets. So for example, um, we were even just reading in the, in that, I just happened to be reading in that, the story of you know, Samson's mother. So um, she's not even named, but an angel of the Lord appears to her and gives her uh, revelation. So she is a prophet. Um, another example of that would be even, for example, Hagar, um, uh, the concubine of Abraham, the mother of Ishmael. Um, again, the angel of the Lord appears to her, and so she also, therefore, will be a prophet. There's all kinds of um, uh, female prophets, anyway, in the Old Testament accounts, but in terms of judges, in the book of Judges, um, Deborah's the only one. Tabukat says, uh, what do you think of the new theories that place the dating of the first four books of Moses to the second century BC, uh, taking their influence from Plato and the Greek world. So I don't um, think, of those, think much of those theories. So I think that, they, um, I think that the uh, first four books of Moses um, have, have all kinds of uh, you know, crazy stuff and crazy layers that speak to um, the end of the first temple period. And so I, I find a lot of resonance in their, in their context with that time period that is right before the destruction of Jerusalem, as opposed to um, this time period that you're talking about, uh, which is the, uh, the time period when the Seleucids and, um, uh, you know, have, ha and the Hasmoneans are fighting over the control and the Hasmoneans are creating this uh, temporary independent kingdom. That is when some of the, a lot of biblical writing is taking place. And so, for example, that's when the book of Daniel is written for sure. We know that. Uh, and, and so you can see even the difference, actually, I think, between how Daniel and other second century texts work in terms of all of these tropes of apocalyptic literature. So this idea that um, uh, God isn't speaking to you, but an angel comes and you see visions and the visions are interpreted in this particular ways. Um, I think that that that, that trope is, um, is present in all kinds of second century BC um, uh, Greek influenced and other, um, other uh, Hebrew and Aramaic, especially writing of the time period, um, as opposed to the Pentateuch, the first four of the, of the books, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, and Numbers. Uh, Unitarian asks, why were the Philistines associated here with giants? Um, so so that, um, that may not have any, I don't know, it, I, that's, I guess I'd have to just speculate. Um, there, is a, there is a biblical association with that, and so there are several times when, um, uh, when again, these legendary or mythic giants exist in the Bible, um, including uh, dating back to this Nephilim, so this time period when the um, sons of God, the rebel angels, and the children of men uh, intermarry before the flood and create this race of giants, the Nephilim, but there is also... Um, uh, a period of time, for example, after the wandering of Israel that, uh, that, that the Israelites send scouts into the land and then they see these giants, these Nephilim, in kind of in the Philistia area. And then finally, again, we have the last of these giants, Goliath, and then these other giants that are associated with Goliath uh, in the Elhanan story. And so there is a thread of this giants and legends about giants um, running around in the Bible, but why it's associated with the Philistines, I don't know, because I don't necessarily you know, think that, you know, it's, it would be different, it would be different if um, this was like Roman legends about Teutons, right? Because we know that like the Germanic peoples were head taller than, um, than the Italians and things like that, but there's no particular reason to think that, uh, I think Mycenaeans or Greeks or any Proto-Greeks are any taller than the local Levantine people. So I don't know that 
there's any particular reason why, like the Philistines, if there is, if it's archaeologically, it's been shown that the Philistines are taller or something like that, but I, I haven't heard that or read that. So it might just be a, a literary association. Um, Q2. Oh, okay. Unitarian also asks, was the later Greco-Roman designation of the region as Palestine meant as a slight against the Jewish population? Yes. So, so the, uh, Palestine was one of the names for the area. So sometimes people want to say that the Romans only did this and they created the name. Um, the, place, the place has many names and there isn't any one because there's all kinds of competing identities. And so even though a lot of... Um, a lot of these peoples are all extremely related to each other and have all of the same kind of language and customs and so forth. They don't consider themselves to be the same people, and so there were multiple overlapping names for how to designate the area. So yes, as we'll see when, um, when we get to the, finally get to this lecture on the, the Bar Kokhba revolt and the, and the final Roman Jewish war, um, the Romans were pretty serious about they were third times the charm for them too, in terms of these wars, and they wanted to wipe uh, Judea off the map, uh, literally. And so, and so it was definitely not meant as a slight only, but also just to get rid of the local Jewish population. They were not allowed to be there anymore. And the same thing happened too. They renamed the city of Jer Jerusalem was wiped out, and it was totally rebuilt, and so and it was renamed, and so it became Alia Capitolina as opposed to um, Jerusalem. And actually, the, almost all of the oldest ruins and even the form of the city as it exists now is primarily ruins of Aelia Capitolina because the Romans so destroyed the preceding city. Anarchy Senpai says, is it possible that Samson's story is actually a commentary on Greeks and Hellenic virtues slash philosophy where even a jawbone of an ass is essentially mocking the idea? Um... So maybe, but here's the thing, uh, is that this particular story um, isn't necessarily, so whereas, whereas I was definitely seeing some Greek stuff in the, in the in this, uh, I'm sorry, the Goliath story, I don't know that there's necessarily anything here that, um, that this has got a Greek or Hellenistic philosophy. So this is um, coming out of a, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's probably intentionally mocking, you know, the fact that it's a jawbone of an ass is probably true, but I don't necessarily think that that's necessarily coming out of Greek or Hellenic philosophy. Uh, I mean, it's, it's too early for that, I think. Uh, Mike Rogers says, it seems the Philistines treated women differently than the Hebrews. What do we know about that? Uh, so one of the things that happens a lot in... Um, so one of the things that will happen a lot in, in literature is that uh, people often think that foreigners treat women differently or that, that, that and they will want to portray, um, they will sometimes even want to portray foreigners as, as, let's say, cowed by their women or being, having to obey their women and so forth. And it's, and it's a slight on, it's a slight on your own, on their manliness and so, so on. And so the Greeks are constantly portraying the Persians that way. There is a difference between how the Persians treated women and maybe better than the Greeks who are notable misogynists. Um, but I don't know that we know anything about that, about the Philistines, because we don't have um, Philistine sources about that as well. So, uh, and, and by the way, we also have this contemporary thing where we actually have a female judge in the form of Deborah in the same book here. So, um, and so, and so whereas, in some ways, that's showing that there could be female leadership. On the other hand, even in that story, it's trying to make the case that if a woman beats you up, that what that kind of shows is that your enemies are, are unmanned, right? And so really, it's God that's doing it. So, so there is some underlying misogyny in the Deuteronomic source here. And so, you know, it's the kind of thing like a, in James Bond is the, the villain the villain uh, Soviet spies are always hot women, right? <laughs> so so it's, it's saying something that the Cold War misogynist British spy, James Bond, is sort of representing the manly values of the West or something like that, and the Soviets are decadent with their 
you know, because women are their spot. I don't know. So it, it, but it doesn't mean anything necessarily about, about um, the reality of the West or the East. It's simply a literary thing, I think, maybe. Uh, Leon says, what does John think was the evil in the sight of the Lord that the Isra- got the Israelites in trouble with their neighbors? So the Deuteronomist's uh, school is very clear what the evil in the sight of the Lord is, which is that you start worshiping the neighbor's gods. So you start, you're not supposed to have a Asherah pole. You're not supposed to, you know, wor- worship uh, Dagon or, or Chemosh or Molech. You're not supposed to make cakes for the queen of heaven. If you do all those things, which by the way, the Israelites were always doing because in the first temple period, the Israelites are pri- predominantly all pagans, just like everybody else. And it is only a tiny, um, it's only a tiny group of reformers, religious reformers uh, centered around the Jerusalem uh, uh, temple priesthood and also the monarchy that are trying to get everybody to be henotheists even, not even real monotheists. Uh, and, so, um, uh, uh, and so anyway, but the point of it is though, uh, Leon, is that the thing you're doing wrong is having other gods. And so the Deuteronomist believes that that will be the solution. Being, becoming a monotheist will be the solution of the problem of evil. But then what ends up happening, we find out in the second temple period is, once the Jewish people are monotheists, they don't only, they don't only prosper. <laughs> so it turns out that, the, um, that the, the Deuteronomic solution to the problem of evil actually doesn't work. And then the people have to ask, well, why, why do the righteous suffer now? We thought it was because of disobedience, but in fact, suffering is more complicated than we originally thought in the Bible. Um, Kenneth Gregory says, who are the Kenites? Are there any mention of them in the Bible outside of the story of Deborah? Is there any significance to Jael being a Kenite? So yes, there are um, a lot of Kenites and there's a whole Kenite thesis and connection. So for example, the Kenites are on the, uh, are listed among the original inhabitants of the promised land in Genesis. Um, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, is sometimes called a Kenite. He's also a Midianite priest, but anyway, he's associated with the Kenites. The Kenites are also mentioned in relationship to the Israel after the conquest of Canaan. And, um, and Saul is actually kind of advising the Kenites at a certain time, you know, so he wants the Kenites to not to break away their, uh, their alliances with other groups like the Amalekites before he attacks the Amalekites. So there's sort of like an allied people. And indeed, um, there's a whole Kenite thesis about some of uh, the Israelite origins and so forth. So it's probably, um, so this is just another example of a Kenite connection here with J.L. being a Kenite. Uh, Rain Weber says, have any modern groups taken Philistine origin myths or are they an entirely extinct culture? Palestine has nothing to do with it. No, so, so Palestine does have something to do with it. So Palestine, um, inherited its name from the Philistines. And the Philistines, um, like I say, are an ancient people that were there. And, um, uh, and ultimately, there is a conquering people, the Peleset, who merged together with a local Canaanite people to become the Philistines, who become a, a Canaanite-speaking people. At a certain point, when the whole area of Palestine or Canaan or Lesser Syria when that all gets overrun by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and ultimately becomes part of the Persian Empire, um, everybody there starts speaking Aramaic and writing in Aramaic, and that includes the people of the Northern Kingdom, the Sumerians, the Samaritans, and also the people of Judah. And so they don't speak Hebrew anymore by the time of Jesus. They're speaking Aramaic. They don't write with the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet anymore. They're using modern Hebrew alphabet, which is Aramaic. They don't use the ancient calendar anymore. They're using the Aramaic calendar, the Babylonian calendar, and so forth, which is the modern Jewish calendar. So in other words, all of the, so the Philistines too, also continue on and continue to be an Aramaic people, and they continue to be a Palestinian people, um, and, you know, uh, subsequently are uh, conquered by, uh, you know, the Persians, then the Greeks, and the Romans, then the um, Persians again, and then the Romans again, and then finally the Arabs. And largely, again, uh, for all of these people, 
Um, usually what happens is the bulk of the people always continue living there. They assimilate to the new language. Uh, there's a whole bunch of admixture of, of people who migrate in and migrate out and so forth, but um, essentially the people are still there to, the, to this day. So, um, or in some cases there was a diaspora where some of them became the Jewish people and are spread all around and some of them have come back. Um, So, uh, yeah, I, I already answered that. So I answered that. So, um, so Fastball Flakes asks, um, John at Center Place, would you lose your power to continuing uh, giving lectures if you had your hair cut off? Um, so I, I grew out my hair for the first time in, in 92, and it's been pretty much sort of like this, a little longer, a little shorter. Uh, in all of that many years. So I, I haven't tested it. It's been, what is that, 33, <laughs> 33 years. Um, but it has sort of become, at a certain point, um, your brand identity. So probably, probably aren't going to, I'm not going to test it anyway. So that's, what we're, that's where we'll leave you. So thanks, guys. And we will see you next week. Uh, you remember what we're talking about next week, Leonardo? <laughs> Oh yeah, Holy Wisdom and the Logos. It's going to be a great, I, great one. It's going to be like, uh, we just had one on the Trinity. We're doing ones of these where we're trying to piece together and understand um, conceptions of God that are both relevant now, but also where they came from historically. So. Yeah, I'm sorry that I didn't get to all the rest of the questions. I appreciate it, and we will uh, talk to you again next week.